Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm your host, Ryan Hines, a communications manager at Biomint. Uh, joining me today is our featured speaker, Ms. Martina Darty, senior brand manager at Hepra, an animal health company. Morning, Martina. Good morning. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Very good. Thanks. And you? Very good. Very well. Thanks. Glad to hear that. So today's topic is coccidiosis vaccination and probiotics, two allies in the search for gut health. This is part two of the Biomin Antibiotic Reduction Expert Series. And of course, Martina is an expert uh, whose current role focuses on coccidiosis and related vaccines. Um, Martina, tell us a little bit more about your background before we get started. Yeah, well, when before joining Ypres, I was working already in research and development for uh, um, biological poultry vaccines. But at that time, I was focused on classical ones like bacterial and viral one. And when I joined Ypres almost 13 years ago, my most focus was on coccidiosis vaccine. And I have to say that it's a very fascinating and at the same time challenging uh, sector. So I'm still enjoying it a lot. Excellent. It's great to hear that. And no doubt it is uh, a common challenge for a lot of poultry producers. And certainly that's something that's gained a lot of interest today. We have a, a, a very large number of people who've turned out uh, to hear this broadcast. So uh, right before we get started, I just wanted to point out uh, two things about today's session. So it's live and interactive. Uh, that means that, first of all, all of our participants who are currently listening can submit their questions uh, using the chat function on your screen. Uh, we'll try to get to as many of these as we can, knowing that we have uh, less, just one hour allotted for today's uh, session. If we don't get to your question, we'll find a way to follow up and get that information to you to help you uh, with your operation. And secondly, we're going to be able to ask you questions as well. So we'll have audience polls where we can get your input and that way we have a bit more of a discussion uh, in this round and that will come up a little bit later. But for now, Martina, I hand it over to you, please. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Uh, well, so today we're going to talk about um, coccidiosis vaccination and probiotics, two allies in the search for gut health. The first part of my presentation will be an introduction about coccidiosis vaccines and coccidiosis vaccination in order for you to understand better the topic. Then we will move into one study that we did uh, where we combined the use of the coccidiosis vaccine together with probiotics in broilers challenged with coccidiosis. And the third part of the presentation will focus on another study that we did where we combined the use of the coccidiosis vaccine with different feed additives, but these times the broilers, they were challenged with necrotic enteritis instead. And then I will explain you why. So just let me uh, do a first introduction uh, about coccidiosis and coccidiosis vaccine. As you know, coccidiosis is a very prevalent disease in poultry production. Uh, it's a very costly disease. There are some studies that uh, says, says that um, the cost of coccidiosis, the annual cost of coccidiosis rounds about 1.52 billion of US dollars, uh, both taking into account the indirect costs for the control measures and the production losses. It's a parasitic disease. This is very important always to keep in mind. That has that can affect and affects mainly the gut of the birds. It has a clear synergism with Clostridium perfringens, and this synergism can bring to necrotic enteritis. And all the category of domestic birds, poultry, they can be affected. So we're talking about broilers, we're talking about layers and, and breeders in general. Um, the control measures that have been used mostly all over the world has always been uh, anticoxidials. So the anticoxidials, they were first developed in the 50s and they were introduced when, let's say, modern poultry started. And they can be divided into two classes. Uh, we have coccidiostats 
that I are able to prevent the development of, of some specific stages of the life cycle of the, of the, of the parasite, whereas the coccidicidals, the drugs, they have the potential of killing or irreversibly damage the parasite at certain point of the life stage. The biggest concern with these anticoxidials is basically that they are developing resistances. Because you have to know that um, this parasite, whenever it gets into contact with any anticoxidial, it has already uh, a subpopulation inside of it that is already resistant to anticoxidials. So the most we keep the parasite in contact with the same anticoxidial the highest number of uh, resistant strains they are going to develop. Another way of preventing this disease is the vaccination. So vaccines have been developed for the first time in the 50s in the United States, and uh, they have been developed several ones uh, after that. But Basically, we are always talking about live vaccines, and then we, I will explain you why. Um, the vaccine are able to give a good and long-lasting uh, protection against the, the vaccine. They are capable of restoring the sensitivity against the anticoxidant, and this is very important because in many cases the vaccines are used for this purpose. They are, they, they've been specifically designed to give uh, an immune response. And if we talk about attenuated vaccines, specifically, they are able to limit also the threat of possible adverse reactions compared to the non-attenuated ones. So why is coccidiosis managed so essential? Uh, basically, we have already said that there is a constant developer of resistance towards the anticoxidials. Um, there are nowadays some government that have made restrictions on the use of coccidiostats. In some countries, some categories of coccidiostats, uh, especially the ionophores, they are considered antibiotics. There will be no further development of new anticoxidials that will come to the market in the near future. In many countries, the antibiotic growth promoter have been uh, withdrawn. There is more and more demand for more organic production and all of these factors they have led to the fact uh, that more and more coccidia vaccine have been used in the latest years. Coccidiosis vaccines can be divided into basically three groups but we will see that in the end we can just take into account the first two. We can have coccidiosis vaccine made of non-attenuated strains. This means that the strains contained in the vaccine, they are, they are virulent ones, pathogenic ones. In this case, what we do with the vaccination is a controlled exposure of the birds to the parasite. Controlled because we give just a limited number of oocysts. In this case, they are very immunogenic, but they can lack in safety because we can have, due to some environmental condition like a high humidity, an overgrowth of these uh, strains, and which can lead directly to a coccidiosis outbreak. These vaccines, they are, this type of vaccine, they are very uh, widespread all over the world, but not in Europe. In Europe, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to be registered due to the safety issues that they have. So the, the vaccine that we have registered in Europe, but nowadays we can find them all over the world as, as well, are the attenuated ones. Amongst the attenuated, we have to make a, a classification into two different groups. We have vaccine that are all made of strains attenuated for precautiousness. And soon after, we will understand what does it mean. Either we have inside this group vaccine that have been attenuated for precautiousness. So some strains have been attenuated for precautiousness, but some other strains, they contain also strains that have been attenuated in another way, which is with passages on chicken embryos. 
and this vaccine they have been registered worldwide, as I said. Finally, we have a category of vaccine that basically included in the past just one vaccine that was registered, which was uh, an inactivated vaccine. So the idea was to vaccine through an injection the breeders with antigens derived from macrogametes of Emeria maxima. And the idea was that the uh, immunity was passing from the breeders to the broilers. Actually, what it was seen is that the humular response, so the antibodies, they are not enough to protect against coccidia. So that's the reason why this vaccine was, uh, was, was marketed for a while, but now is not on the market anymore. Excellent. Thank you for that quick overview, uh, Martina. Let's take a minute to turn the tables and ask our audience uh, about their familiarity with these types of vaccines and what they may be currently using or uh, recommending in their businesses. So let's take our first poll question opportunity and you'll see the question up on your screen. What type of coccidiosis vaccine do you use or recommend? Uh, please select the single best answer that corresponds to you. Uh, the answer choices are none, non-attenuated strains, attenuated strains, inactivated, other, or don't know. And as we're seeing those responses come in, we've had already nearly half of our participants vote. So we're gonna leave it for just a few more seconds. And then we're gonna be able to read out those results. And we're gonna see uh, where people are currently. It sounds like this has some dependence on what products are available or geographically speaking, um, what solutions are most popular. So it'll be interesting to see where we stand there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead now with two thirds of our audience voting. We're going to close the poll. All right, so let's have a look. So attenuated strains came out as the predominant type of coccidiosis vaccine, user recommended in operations at 57%, so right. the, the vast majority. Uh, we had 18% and 16% that either none, other, or don't know. So it looks like uh, there is a bit of uncertainty there. And the non-attenuated strains, just 4% and inactivated only at 6%. So it seems like there's a very clear option here that came out as most popular for Martina. Is very this, good. how does this correspond with what you see in the field with your customers? Well, actually uh, we still have, well, in, in, in the vast majority of the world, non-attenuated vaccine are very much popular. And because uh, it is true that the attenuated vaccine, they just arrived later on the market, on those markets. In fact, the attenuated vaccine, they were mostly recluded to Europe so far, but in the last five years, uh, they have started to be widespread all over the world. So I think that with the time being, they will be definitely become more popular even in this outside Europe, for sure. All right, excellent, great to see that. Please continue. Okay. So uh, in order to understand a little bit better how we do the attenuation of these uh, attenuated by precautiousness strains, we need to understand a little bit better about the life cycle of Emeria. So basically the life cycle of Emeria is divided into three parts. We have up on the left, the sporogony, which is the part of the cycle that takes place in the external environment. In this part of the cycle, the oocyst becomes infective, which means that it forms four sporocysts inside of its wall, and each sporocyst contains two sporozoi. Whenever a chick or a bird mm, ingests one of these infected sporocysts, uh, oocyst, the, the oocyst gets to the gizzard, and there, thanks to the grinding movement of the gizzard and the acid content of the gizzard, you have the release of the sporocyst, of the spor of the sporocyst. These sporocysts, when they get to the intestine, thanks to the enzyme and the bile contact, they release the sporozoites. 
the sporozoites, they make their way through the intestine and they get to the enterocyte. They enter inside the enterocyte and thanks to a process called merogony, they form a very big cell called schizome. These cells grow and break the enterocytes. This is the real damage that coccidiosis gives. Breaks the cells and releases many more merozoites. These merozoites, they are able to enter again inside another enterocyte. They make the same, they make the merogony, they, they form a big schizome that again breaks the enterocyte and releases other merozoite. This part of the cycle is very important and is called schizogony or asexual replication phase. And in this part of the cycle, we have the real damage that coccidiosis gives to our birds into the gut. These schizogony cycles, they usually have different waves. So we have a first schizogony phase, a second one, a third one, up to a fourth one. And in this way, the parasite multiplies itself. So we go from one single oocyst that got into the bird to many thousands that are released through the feces again in the environment. Then all of a sudden, nobody knows why, instead of the formation of a schizont, we have a formation inside the cell of a macrogamont. This is the gamogony or the sexual phase of replication of the parasite. This macrogamont is fecundated by microgamonts. It's a sexual replication, so it's a real fecundation with the formation of an immature oocyst that is released in the external environment with the feces. Please remember this uh, cycle because it's very important to understand how we get to the attenuation. So, and especially the schizogony. Regarding the immunology, it's also important to remember one other point. Whenever an antigen gets to the bird, the way our bird or our immune system will respond depends on two factors. If the pathogen is an intracellular pathogen, like in this case, Ameria, we need to elicit a cell-mediated immunity because it's the only immunity that really protects against Ameria. So we have the antigenic presenting cells that present the antigen to the naive T cells. And this presentation of the antigen releases and elicits a TH1 response, which leads to the formation of T cytotoxic T cells that together with the NK cells, they are the only ones that are able to find the parasite when it's inside the cells and destroy it. If we elicit an immune, uh, a humoral immune response, so with the, with the uh, formation of antibodies, this is not able to stop the replication of the parasite. So remember, the cell-mediated immunity is the most important to protect against coccidiosis. So how do we do the attenuation? So the attenuation by precautiousness is something that we didn't invent. It's something that was firstly discovered in 1975 by Thomas Jeffrey in the United States, that it was the first one that was able to attenuate a strain of Emera tenella through selection for precautiousness. And how does it work, this process? I don't know if you are familiar with the, sorry. Hi, Martina. I just wanted to jump in there for uh, one point of clarification. Could you help our audience? We did uh, receive a couple questions about precociousness and how to right. understand that. Right, okay. I was just get, getting into the subject right now. Wonderful. So what do we do? If you are familiar with this type of um, graphics, as you can see, this is the pattern of excretion of a strain of, um, of a media. For example, we could say a tenella. We have on the y-axis the osis per gram and on the x-axis the days. So after we inoculate one bird or a group of birds, after a pre-pattern period, which is the period between the inoculation and the excretion of the osis, 
you have the first excretion of oocyst. Then you have a peak of excretion in this group of birds or in the bird that we are taking into account, and then it goes down. What we do with the attenuation is to collect these first oocysts that are the first one that we find in the feces. The first, the quickest one, we could say this way. We clean, we clean them, we collect them, we clean them, and then we make a second inoculation in another group of birds. And we do the same, we just collect these first oocysts. So basically what do we do is that we create a selective pressure for the quickest oocysts. We do like this several number of times. We never know when to stop when we start the process because the process has to be the perfect balance between safety and efficacy, okay? We do like this up to when we obtain a strain that if we compare it to the parental strain, you will see there is a huge difference. The prepatent period is shorter. So the time between the infection and the excretion of the oocyst in the feces is shorter compared to the parental strain, to the mother strain from where it comes from, but also the area below the curve, the curve is smaller, which means that these attenuated strains, they are not able to produce the same amount of oocysts as the parental one. But why is that? So why is that, that the attenuated strain, they have a shorter pre period because they have less schizogony. If you remember, I told you to remember the schizogony phase, which is the phase that really causes the damage in the birds. They have, I've told you that we can have three to up to, from up to three, four schizogony phases inside the enterocytes where the parasite multiplies. But in the case of the attenuated, strains. So in the case of the quick stosis, we have seen that already during the second schizogony phase, the schizons are smaller, the merozoites are smaller, and we already see some macrogamonts and some microgamonts, which means that these quick stosis, they just have one schizogony phase and they just get soon after into gamogony. So that's why they have less schizogony. And the consequence of this is that they also cause less macroscopic and microscopic lesions. But if you remember, I've told you that during the schizogony, it is where the parasite multiplies. Shortening the schizogony will also reduce the reproductive potential of the, of the oocysts of these strains compared to the parental strains. So hope, I really hope that you understood a little bit, you've understood a little bit more about coccidia vaccines. Oh, didn't mean to interrupt you there. Absolutely. Uh, I want to thank you for that overview. I mean, it's certainly detailed. We get a picture uh, from the parasite's life cycle of exactly where intervention is necessary, how to develop vaccine based on that balance you mentioned between safety and efficacy. So thank you for that first section. Uh, as we turn the page, uh, let's take an opportunity to do our second audience poll question. Uh, and we're going to breach the topic of poultry probiotics. Uh, so our question for the audience right now, before we get into that discussion is, do you currently use or recommend probiotics in and around the time of vaccinations in poultry flocks? The options for answers are yes, no, and not sure. And we see those votes are currently coming in. We have half of our attendees voted. Everyone was quick to respond on this question. So we're just going to give it another few seconds and then we're going to see what the results are. We have two thirds of our audience have been weighed in. So let's push pause there. Okay, and have a look at the results, Martina. It's in this resounding yes. So we have Are you good? a lot of people who have already uh, recommend or apply probiotics around vaccination time, uh, a quarter who do not, and uh, about half of that, again, who are not quite sure if they do or do not. Uh, so now is probably an opportunity for those that second and third group, Martina, 
uh, to talk about why that might be a good idea. So please. Very good. Very good. Sure. So in this second part of my presentation, I'm going to explain you about a study that we ran um, some time ago about the combination of a coccidiosis vaccine for broilers with a probiotic in broilers challenge with coccidiosis. So we know that probiotic, especially uh, multi-species probiotic, they are able to uh, regulate the gut microflora, and especially in those environments where we have to work without antibiotic growth promoters, but also without anticoxidials, because as you know, whenever you use a coccidiosis vaccine, you cannot use anticoxidial as well, because all the strains contain into the vaccine, they're very sensitive towards anticoxidia. So the hypothesis was that for sure there should have been a beneficial effect with a combination of coccidia vaccine together with a probiotic. In this case, the trial was run with poultry star. So probiotics are known to be direct fed microbials and are classified as live non-pathogenic microorganisms. They are in fact capable of maintaining a good microflora uh, population through different mechanisms like the antagonism with pathogens, competitive exclusion, and they also they are able to stimu stimulate the immune system. Um, in this way, they help to maintain the gut uh, microflora. And in general, there can be a benefit in terms of performances, but also in terms of protection against other enteric diseases. And they're also able to elicit the immunity of the birds, because as we know, the highest part of the immune system, the biggest part of the immune system in our birds is located in the gut. So the objective of the study was to study and evaluate the added value of combining a symbiotic. So poultry star is a symbiotic because it's a combination of uh, probiotics plus prebiotics with an attenuated and live attenuated coccidiosis vaccine, which at that time was Ipracox, um, in birds challenged with a mix of coccidia strains at day 15. So in the study design, we use 456-day-old uh, male Ross breed. Uh, they were located, they were uh, out, they were on wood shaving on floor pens. We had three different groups, and each group had three replicates, and each replicate contained 19 birds. So the groups into study were uh, the uninfected and treated control, which was the negative, which I'm going to call negative control from now on, the infected untreated control, which I'm going to call um, positive control from now on. And the third one was the treatment group. That was the group that received Ipracox at day of age, at the arrival of the birds on farm via drinking water in bell drinkers, plus poultry star. And poultry star was given during the first three days in a row as well in the water in the bell drinkers. Whereas starting from uh, that moment, it was given in the feed from day one to day 14 uh, at a rate of one kiloton, whereas from day 15 to day 35, so up to the end of the studies, was given at, half of, uh, at 0 0.5 uh, kiloton. So the inoculum that the challenge was given at day 15, as I already said, and was a mix of Acervulina, Maxima, Tenella, Mitis, and Precox, which are the five species contained in the vaccine. On day 21 and 22, we collected two birds in order to perform um, necropsies, post-mortem, in order to assess uh, the lesion score over these birds. We also performed the OSIS per gram counts, so the so-called OPGs, uh, at day 6, 7, 22, and 29. And we also perform, um, we also recorded all the performance parameters at day 1, 8, 15, 22, and 35. Of course, mortality was recorded daily. So let's get into the results. As you can see, during the first necropsy at day 21, 
in the control group, the positive control in this case, the level of lesion was above three, whereas in the negative control we had almost uh, less than one. As you can see in the treatment group, we had a significant decrease in the level of lesions compared to the positive control with no statistically significant differences compared to the negative control. Whereas in the, uh, in the day 22, there was no statistically significant difference in the decrease of the lesions in the treatment group compared to the positive control, but anyway, it was numerical difference, so it was um, decreased compared to the positive control. Results of the OPG, it is interesting here to note that in the treatment group, which is the dark green, as you can see, you can start already seeing the excretion of the OCs at day six and seven, which is absolutely normal because the treatment group was a group that was vaccinated. Interestingly, if you look at day 22, and if you remember we did the challenge at day 15, so it is seven days after the challenge. As you can see, there is a huge difference between the positive control and the treatment group. In the positive control, the positive control is almost scraping double or even more than double the number of oocysts than the treatment group, revealing that the birds, they were already well protected and immunized at the time of the challenge, so 15 days after the vaccination. Looking at mortality as well, even if there are no statistically significant difference uh, between the treatment group and the positive control, there was numerically a huge decrease in the mortality compared to the positive control. If we go to the productive parameters, as you can see, there were no statistically significant differences in the daily feed intake among all the three groups. But if we move to the daily weight gain, you can see there was a statistically significant difference in the positive, in the treatment group and in the negative control compared to the positive control. So the increase it was uh, in the daily weight gain was far better. Looking at the weight gain, at the body, uh, the body weight, sorry, at the end of the, of the flock, again, there was an improvement in the treatment group and in the negative control compared to the positive control. Whereas in the feed conversion, the only group that had a statistically significant difference was the, um, was the negative control. However, the treatment group had a, um, a feed conversion that was 1.52 compared to the positive control that was 1.58. So six points less in the treatment group compared to the positive control. So take home messages. We have seen that the combination with probiotic and vaccine can be beneficial because we had overall an improvement in the productive parameters, but also in the mortality of the, of the group that received the two treatments. Probiotic can be, um, can exclude pathogens, of course, such as E. coli and salmonella, but specifically in our case, it was very important that it excluded Clostridium perfringens, which is the, um, the pathogen that can really overgrowth in environments where you don't use neither anticoxidials nor antibiotic growth promoters. And also another positive effect for sure is the fact that the probiotic they can modulate the immune system and this can help to improve for sure, the efficacy of the vaccine. So last considerations about this study is that the results show that the combination of a coccidiosis vaccine with a multi-species symbiotic had a positive impact on the performances of the birds and in the lesion scoring after the challenge with coccidia. So the combination of Ipracox in this case and poultry star suggests a beneficial effect on the digestion and overall gut health. But however, when we got to this point, um, we thought that it was necessary to go a little bit further. And we realized that further studies in broilers, this, this time challenge with necrotic enteritis, they were needed. 
And that what leads me to the last part of my presentation, which is the last, the most recent study that we performed, where we tested the efficacy of an attenuated coccidiosis vaccine in combination with different uh, feed additives, but this time in broilers challenged with necrotic enteritis. So we know that necrotic enteritis is an intestinal infection. We know that this infection needs many times a predisposing factor, which can be coccidia. And uh, coccidia, the damage caused by the coccidiosis, can lead to this overgrowth of, of clostridium perfringens. So the initial hypothesis was that, for sure, the prevention of this lesion through the use of an attenuated vaccine was, was uh, supposed to help to prevent the, 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 the disease, the necrotic enteritis. Um, we know for sure that when we use vaccines, we cannot use anticoxidials, as we have already said, and we know that some anticoxidials, they have an anticoxidial effect. So therefore, when vaccinating, one of the biggest risks is the, the, that we can trigger that we, can, we don't have anything to fight against this bacterial enteritis, this biosis or necrotic enteritis. So the idea in this study was to test the combination of the vaccine together with different feed additives. So as you can see here, we have used 960 male chickens uh, divided in 48 groups with 20 chicks uh, each group. We had six different treatments and eight replicate per treatment. The first group is the negative control, so the unchallenged, unvaccinated or untreated group. The second group was the untreated but challenged one, so the positive control. The third group was just receiving the vaccine alone. The fourth group was receiving the vaccine together with a product based on medium chain fatty acid with a 47% of inclusion of lauric acid and this product was given in the feed all along the life of the birds the fifth group was receiving the vaccine together with a short chain fatty acid basically sodium butyrate again it was given in the feed all along the the life of the birds and the sixth group was the one receiving the vaccine plus a phytogenic feed additive and again this phytogenic feed additive was based on essential oil and benzoic acid and it was given all along the life of the bird. The necrotic enteritis challenge model uh, was, is composed of three different steps. We have a day 15, um, an Emeria Maxima challenge, which is done by a very low dose of Emeria Maxima, pathogenic, of course, strain of Emeria Maxima. Five days after, the birds are challenge again but this time with the clostridium perfringen so as you can see we need to prepare the clostridium perfringen um, ground before with a with a maxima um, challenge and all along this period the grower feed was formulated to provide predisposing factor for the necrotic enteritis development we monitored again all the productive parameters all along the the period of the study clinical signs, mortality, daily. I'm not going to show you all of these results, but only the most relevant ones. Body weight. So on day 14, as you can see, so we are before the challenge, because if you remember, the first challenge was done at day 15. Before the challenge, as you can see here in the six different groups, this is the negative control, the positive control, the vaccine, vaccine plant, medium chain fatty acid, short chain fatty acid, and phytogenic feed additive. As you can see, all the groups that were receiving the vaccine, they are slightly behind compared to the uh, controls, but this is normal because in this case, we are talking about the fact that the vaccine is replicating in the birds. However, you see a big difference after the challenge. So, at day 20, we did the last challenge, we did the challenge with the uh, Clostridium perfringens. As you can see, the positive control, the, the, the positive control is the one with the lowest weight, as it should be. The, the, the group receiving the vaccine alone has no statistically significant difference compared to the 
ne um, negative control. And all the treatment groups, like the group, um, the group of the medium chain fatty acids, and the other groups, they are the ones with the highest uh, weight. Anyway, uh, you can see that the ones with the highest weight is the group with the medium chain fatty acid in this case. At day 2042, there were no statistically significant differences in the weight. This is because in experimental condition, even if you challenge the birds and you keep them living so long, up to 42 days, there is always a compensatory growth. So in this case, we didn't see any difference, differences at the end of the cycle. Interestingly, the, and the most interesting part is for sure the feed conversion, which is also the parameter that interests our that interests the production more, and is that the group receiving the medium chain fatty acids, so group four and group six, they show the lowest FCR with a statistically significant difference from group three, that was the group receiving the vaccine alone, and the group receiving the vaccine plus the strong chain fatty acid. Of course, if we compare the vaccine alone, we can say that also we could achieve a good results because there was no dif statistically significant difference compared to the negative control and the group five and six. So considerations. Uh, we saw that the vaccine alone was able to reduce some of the product productivity losses associated with necrotic enteritis, but by far the combination of the vaccine event in the, together with feed, in feed medium chain fatty acid and phytogenics at an added value on the FCR compared to the other group that was receiving only the vaccine and the short chain fatty acid. So we can say that the combination of preventing the gut damage with an attenuated coccidiosis vaccine and a possible reduction of the pathogenic load of clostridium thanks with, uh, with medium chain fatty acid or um, uh, phytogenic feed additives may have had a synergistic effect in this study. So in conclusion, taking into account that the optimal gut health is fundamental in this ever increasing need of broilers um, raised without antibiotic growth promoters and anticoxidials. Nowadays, it's crucial to find the best combination between a coccidiosis vaccine and feed additives that are able to maintain the gut balance, such as probiotic, phytogenic, or medium chain fatty acids. This combination needs to guarantee the best protection through the vaccination, but also the best productive results and the optimal gut health. In the common practice, I have to tell you that the use of coccidiosis vaccine with probiotics or, pre or symbiotics is already a reality, and we are using it quite a lot with very good results in terms of gut health and antibiotic reduction. But for sure, we need to do future trials and to continue on this path, combining the use of this coccidiosis vaccine with other probiotics and phytogenic feed additives in order to um, prevent uh, any kind of um, disruption to our gut health. Excellent, Martina. Uh, thank you for sharing those results with us. We have had a lot of questions, a lot of opportunities here for discussions. We're gonna use uh, the remaining portion Good. of the time we have to get to as many of those as we can. Uh, but from what we see already, there's certainly a, a clear role and an added value for using uh, coccidia vaccines and these alternatives to antibiotics in production systems. So thank you for that. Uh, let's get started with our first question. Um, this one goes uh, more to the basics of um, infection and disease and dealing with these parasites. If coccidiosis infects a chicken at a younger age, does that create a permanent damage to the total health of the chicken up through maturity? Is, is that a lasting effect? Well, uh, actually, um, I've always been thinking in the past that, the, that in the case of a, a early lesion of coccidiosis, uh, the birds, they would have been able uh, to recover uh, with the time. 
with a compensatory growth uh, if they were given, of course, enough time to recover. But in reality, I have seen that um, even if we give the birds enough time to recover, but they are hit by a damage of coccidiosis damage at a fairly at an early age, it is true that they will never completely recover from this damage, which means that they will always have this loss in performances that it will we, they will be never able to recover. Okay, so they're really, I mean, the, the strategy that you want to employ sounds like prevention is the best way to Correct. avoid these financial losses, right? Correct, absolutely. Like, um, and prevention, prevention at an early stage, which means that, in fact, using uh, this coccidiosis vaccine, it really gives you the opportunity to have a very early uh, protection because they are able to develop immunity starting from the second week of age which means that really the birds, they are uh, well immunized all along the cycle of their life. Great. On to our next question. Uh, this regards the materials used for litter uh, on site. So uh, in the options of looking at, you know, straw pellets, wood shavings, straw, cut straw, um, could the choice of material influence the results of a vaccination program? Absolutely, yes. Um, in fact, um, when we were looking at the immunology uh, part, I, um, I, didn't, I didn't get uh, too much into details, but um, the, the, the idea is that the birds, they need several exposure, at least two, up to three exposure to the vaccine before developing immunity. So we need uh, this cycle to happen in the gut of the birds, at least for two or three times, which means that the birds, they need to excrete the first uh, oocyst after the vaccination. These oocysts, they need to sporulate in the litter, they need to be re-ingested, and they need to replicate again, which means that the environment is also very much important. So it, whenever we have very dry litter, this prevents the sporulation even of the vaccinal oocyst, also of the field strain, but even of the vaccinal oocyst, which means that probably the second uh, replication or the third replication, it can take longer. So this can delay the immunity, definitely the onset of the immunity. So it's very important also to take this aspect into account when doing a, a coccidiosis vaccination. Absolutely. Now, uh, staying on the floor for a minute, so to speak, um, the question, the next question is, a coccidia vaccine important for chickens reared in raised floor closed house system? Well, you mean um, in closed house, it means they cannot go out or? I believe that's what's intended by this question. On a raised floor, I believe is the raised flooring is. is well, they mean part. on the floor. Yeah, yeah, no. I, what? Whenever you do a coccidiosis vaccination, it is very important, uh, which is something that really comes even from the previous question, they have to be on the floor. We need to create certain conditions for the oocysts to sporulate. So whenever they are raised on a different surface, it can become triggering. Yeah? We, are, we, we know there are methods, there are ways to make them recycle, cycle, like we say the, in, the, in, the, in the coccidiosis field, we call about cycling. Uh, of the vaccine, you can make them cycle even on papers, for example, but by far the best way to make them cycle in the correct way is that they are raised on the floor. All right, uh, let's move on to a question that goes to how to choose a vaccine. Um, so choosing, this isn't the question of non-attenuated versus attenuated vaccines. Is this a matter of a mode of action, how they work, or is there a cost difference, a price uh, component that plays into the decisions? Okay. Well, it, the, if we are driven by the by the the, the choice of uh, which vaccine I have to choose, we have to think about if it is like for which kind of category of birds I want to protect. If I'm talking about broiler or if I'm talking about breeders or layers. The birds that live longer, they have different species of Emeria that can affect them. And this is not because the broilers, they cannot be affected, for example, by Necatrix or Brunetti. 
but because they don't live enough to be affected by them. So first of all, we have to decide which kind of category of birds I'm talking about. I'm talking about layers or breeders, or I'm talking about broilers. So this tells you already something about which composition of vaccine I need. So if I need to include some species or not. And apart from that, if we talk from an economical point of view, it is clear and, and everyone knows that the attenuated vaccine, they are more expensive. And they are more expensive for one reason. The reason I mentioned during my presentation is that they lose the reproductive potential. Losing the reproductive potential, we need more uh, effort to produce the same amount of oocysts which makes that this vaccine in the end, they are more, uh, more expensive when they get to the market. That's for sure. So if you are driven by an economical uh, reason, probably your first input is gonna be, I'm gonna choose a non-attenuated vaccine. But then you have to think about all the drawbacks that a non-attenuated vaccine can give you. If it causes some damages in the gut because it's more aggressive, you can have the need of using more antibiotic, for example, and this is another cost. Also, they can affect your productive performances because if you have um, a strain cycling so long in the birds or later on in the birds, because if you remember, the attenuated ones are the precocious ones, so they cycle at the beginning, whereas the non-attenuated, they cycle as the normal field strains, so they can continue cycling up to four, five weeks, and this cycling can be very harmful also for the performances. So if you take into account even also this aspect, maybe in the end, even if on the paper the cost is higher, you don't have a real um, return of investment using um, an unattenuated vaccine. Uh, so, so it sounds like there needs to be a best fit with um, for higher value animals. Absolutely. That's what I'm hearing. Um, and let's let's uh, so we're looking at different stages, uh, different value animals. Um, how about turkeys? We've had several questions there about the results you've shared uh, today, and how much of the results that you've shown. You're talking about broiler animals, I believe. Uh, is that applicable to turkeys, or is it a different case altogether? Well, actually, uh, turkeys are different animals <laughs> and different birds. So starting from the fact that a vaccine used for broilers cannot be used for uh, turkeys. The, the species of Aimeria that affect turkeys are completely different from the species of Aimeria that affect uh, um, broilers or poultry. Um, in general, there is no cross protection amongst species. So imagine among different species of birds, there is definitely no possibility of uh, using a vaccine for um for pol for uh, chickens in poles uh even if i'm i strongly believe that all the principles of protection against coccidiosis plus the use of uh, any compounds that can help to maintain the gut health it's absolutely you can translate it into uh turkey completely but you have to use different type of vaccines what well, different made of different species of Emeria. but nowadays there is just one vaccine registered worldwide for for turkey eh? there's no more than one okay interesting um moving on to our next questions we've got about five minutes left uh can we use so you you talked a lot about the antibiotic free the uh custodia set free um, environments where these vaccines and alternatives to antibiotics could be used. Um, but can you use a vaccine for, for coccidiosis and an anti-coccidiosis together? Well, actually, you cannot use um, um, a vaccine against, um, you cannot use a vaccine together with anticoccidios. The, anti the vaccine strains, they are very sensitive to anticoccidial. Small traces of anticoccidial can really kill the vaccine. So absolutely, it is very important to avoid any kind of use of anticoccidial whilst using the vaccine. And um, it is also even more true when you use attenuated vaccines. The attenuated vaccine, they lose 
the capability of developing resistances. And so that's the reason why we cannot really use uh, any kind of anticoxidant whilst using the, the, the vaccine. And this is also why, even more, it's very important to take care about gut health even more. Absolutely. So <clears throat> it sounds like a very clear no in that case. Uh, that's good to know. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have time for a few more, I believe. Uh, we have a question about whether there is any impact from probiotics or probiotic poultry star in this case to influence the life cycle of the coccidiosis vaccine to complete the vaccine effect. No, absolutely. That's that's um, that's the reason why we did the first trial. So during the first trial, the idea was uh, to um, prove that there was no negative interaction between the two compounds, so the vaccine and the probiotic. And that really, uh, it was very clear to us that there was no negative interaction amongst the two. And uh, that's even why we want to go further on these studies and try even more the vaccine together with the probiotic in an acrotic interactive environment, because we are, we are very sure, we already know it from the, from the field. Eh? because we are already using it together. But it would be it's going to be very interesting to see it in experimental uh, environment, because we are sure that there are going to be even a more synergic effects. And we're going to also prove more that there is no negative impact, but on the contrary, there is a synergism between the two, the two compounds. OK. Uh, we have another question along the same vein. Uh, about the timing. So what time does the probiotic have an effect on the gut when both the vaccine and probiotic are administered on the same day at day one? So no, there is. it is absolutely possible. We have done it and we are doing it and there is no negative interaction. I mean, usually we do it directly either in the drinking water when it's possible but sometimes uh, we can also do it more simply with through a spraying device. We can mix them together. We have also done studies and we have seen that there is no uh, interaction amongst the vaccine and the probiotic during the, the, the mixing of the two solutions. And you can, really, uh, you can really use them together without any problems, okay. starting from day of age. Okay, good to know. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I think that will actually be our last question because as we're looking through here, I'm not exaggerating, we've had over a hundred submissions of questions for you and we can't keep you here all day. <laughs> so uh, I wanna thank you for your time uh, and thank you for sharing uh, those interesting results with us. Of course, we will um, make this, we're, we're gonna make this recording available uh, to everyone uh, uh, in, in the, coming hours and days uh, so they can be reviewed. And of course, um, both HIPAA and Biomin are available to be contacted about further information. Sure. For the questions specifically about Poultry Star, um, you can go ahead and contact your Biomin representative once we close this session. We actually have a post-webinar survey. You can give us your feedback. We'd really appreciate it if you let us know if this session was useful for you and what other topics you'd like to hear about. But if you'd also like to hear from a Biomin uh, sales representative to get more information, you can also mark a box and uh, have that discussion as well. I want to thank you for that. And Thanks. as an information, I want to let everyone know that the Antibiotic Reduction Expert Series continues next week. So with part three, uh, please join us on April 21st at 10 a.m. Central European time. And there we're going to be having uh, Let's see, uh, Daniel Parker, a senior veterinarian in Slate Hall Veterinary Practice, who's going to be sharing a veterinarian perspective on antibiotic free production. Um, so stay tuned for that. You can hear about how uh, the UK poultry sector delivered um, very considerable reductions in antibiotic use as we continue along this theme. So I want to thank you all on behalf of Biomin. Martina, thank you again. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you all. Join us next time. Bye. Bye.